Okay, let's get started. Obviously, we have a reconfigured classroom here. Seems a little bit better. For those of you that are in the back row, can you see the bottom of this slide? Yes, more or less. Okay, okay great. So uh, just to get into the uh, rhythm of things here, at the beginning of uh, every class, I'll come back to the schedule so we know where we are and where we're going. <coughs> we'll talk a little bit about logistics in a moment. And then we'll finish up uh, the last few slides on lecture one, and then we'll start in on uh, lecture two today, and we'll probably make it through most of uh, lecture two. Um, let's talk about the quizzes for a moment. Uh, I noticed that a number of you got one of the three quiz questions wrong, and with the students that I talked to, the reason was is because you didn't do the, the reading. So just a reminder that the, quiz, the questions on the quiz are going to come from stuff we talk about in class and or the reading that's assigned for today. So that being said, I, could, I went back and had a look and I could see how you could make an argument for or against one of those questions. So for those of you that did get that question wrong, I'll go back today and amend it and give you back the points for, for that question. Okay. But I definitely recommend before you tackle the quiz tonight, make sure you've made it through at least most uh, of the reading and you're pretty comfortable with stuff we talked about in lecture. Fair? Yes? So it would be the material on the pre-lecture reading for the day of the quiz. That's correct. So let me go back to the schedule for a moment. So the quiz for last Tuesday covered stuff from okay. what we talked about in class and the reading for that day. Your quiz tonight will draw on material from whatever we get through in lecture one and two today and today's reading. Good? Okay. Uh, that's the quiz. Let's talk about assignment one for a moment. Uh, as I suggested last time, a good idea to jump on this one early. For some of you, you might be using some Python packages that you haven't come across before. For most of you, the submission mechanism for this class is probably going to be new as well, so don't leave this one to the night, the night before. Any questions about the first assignment? Has everyone started in on it yet? More or less? Okay. One item I just wanted to bring up that sometimes is a bit of an issue. Uh, let's see. Step number six in uh, the first assignment where you're implementing the hill climber. The heart of the hill climber, like we talked about last time, is you have your parent genotype, which for the moment is just a vector of numbers. You make a copy of that parent vector, and after you make a copy, you perturb it in some way. You introduce a slight change somewhere in that vector. Uh, I suggest you make use of Python's deep copy operation. So a, a, a problem in Python that often uh, arises is you're not sure whether you've made a shallow or a deep copy. So a shallow copy means you've made a copy of actually a pointer, and those two pointers paint, point to the same data structure. So you can get into the situation where you think you've made a copy of the parent and you introduce a change to the child here, but you're actually making a change to the data structure that both the parent and the child point to. The child does worse, you throw the child away, but unbeknownst to you, you still have that mutation that's now in the parent. So a deep copy, as the name implies, will take whatever data structure you're trying to copy, which in this case is the parent, and make a copy of everything in the parent and what it points to. So you have two separate copies. Now if you make a change to the child, it has no effect on the parent. This is a common issue that, that arises in this assignment. Make sense? Okay. Yes? When is the homework due? When is the homework due? It's due uh, Monday night, 11.59 p.m. on Monday. Okay, I think that's all I have to say uh, on that. <coughs> Let's go back to uh, lecture one, and we were on slide number 13 here, and we were talking about why you might be interested in studying robotics. We talked about why robots in general might be useful. Clearly, if we could get robots that could help us in outdoor environments, there would be a huge practical and economic use to that. There's also uh, intellectual interest in robotics. What we actually mean by intelligence is kind of an open problem. Nobody really knows 
what the answer is going to be. It's one of the relatively few branches in science and engineering that's, that's completely open. Okay, so we talked about why robots, why you might want to have robots outside. We ended last time by narrowing our motivation to why would you study evolutionary robotics. As I mentioned, and as you'll see as we go along in this course, evolutionary robotics is a very small subfield in the much larger general field of robotics. Why apply ideas from evolution to the creation of adaptive and autonomous machines? Well, the first reason why is if you take a complex machine, like the nonoped that we saw at the end of class last time, and actually sit down and try and write a controller for it, or even more simply than that, try and figure out which piston should expand or contract at what time, it is an exceedingly non-intuitive thing to do. Right? For some of you, programming your computers may be intuitive. For some of you, maybe not so much. If you think programming is sometimes non-intuitive, try programming a robot. It's extremely difficult to do. So in evolutionary robotics, we're going to try and automate the way that we devise controllers for the robot. So evolutionary robotics actually has automation at two levels. We're trying to create an autonomous machine. So ultimately, this machine is going to be controlled by a neural network, which we haven't talked about yet. So it's autonomous. There's no one remote controlling this robot. And this autonomous machine, we are trying to create that autonomous machine with an autonomous process. So this is, again, a good thing to keep in the back of your mind as we go forward. Which level are we talking about at any, any given time? Okay, so if we want to try and take our hands off the programming of robots directly, we want to have something do the programming. In our case, it's going to be an evolutionary uh, algorithm. There are lots of other approaches in robotics where instead of using an evolutionary algorithm to try and come up with a controller for the robot, we're going to use a learning algorithm so that the robot can learn on its own uh, how to move. There is a lot of differences between learning and evolution, and we're going to see several of them as we go along in this course. For our purposes, when we're talking about trying to design robots, the main difference between learning and evolution is learning is restricted to the brain. But evolution, of course, didn't just sculpt our brains over millions of years. It sculpted our bodies along with our brains. So the advantage, or the main advantage, I would argue, for evolutionary approaches over learning approaches is that we can expand the things about the robot that we place under evolutionary control. Let's see if this video works here. Let's see if I can play it for you. Okay, this is a snapshot from uh, one of my own research projects several years ago, and we'll come back and talk about this one a little bit later. So again, you're now watching an evolutionary algorithm in progress, where it's performing this trial and error process and trying out these robots. And as you can obviously see from this video, this evolutionary algorithm in this case is not taking a fixed robot and trying to find a good brain for that robot, it is also evolving the body along with the brain. So the bodies in this case are made up of these cells that are attached <laughs> together. The, sh the gray shading of the cells tells me something about the neural network that's inside this robot. And you can see that some of these robots are doing a better or worse job. Given just what you see here, what do you think the fitness function is? What is evolution trying to evolve a robot to do? How far out of the box is it? How far out of the box or in, into the screen, right? And it's come up so far with this odd-looking creature, which somehow seems to, to work. OK, so for the moment, at least, we're going to distinguish between learning and evolution in the sense that uh, learning is restricted to making changes to the brain. So a fixed single robot can get better over time. Evolution is a more flexible tool because it allows us to optimize not just the brain, but also the body. OK. Why else might we want to apply evolutionary ideas to robotics? Well, ultimately, the long-term goal in robotics and AI is to try and make intelligent machines. And we have an existence proof that biological evolution can produce intelligent machines. 
It took Mother Nature a very long time to do so, but she did, right? So if evolution can do it once with carbon, maybe we can get evolution to do it again with silicon. Third reason why we might want to use evolution to try and automate this process of producing autonomous machines. Importantly, in biological evolution, Mother Nature did it with no supervision, right? Survival of the fittest. Now there is artificial selection, right? Our ancestors domesticated wolves into dogs and uh, teosente into corn over tens of thousands of years. So there was directed selection with supervision in that case, but in natural selection, there's no real teacher, right, other than, than survival. So this issue about supervision is an important one in robotics and AI. And if you study uh, machine learning methods, in addition to evolutionary algorithm, you'll hear mention uh, over and over again of supervised learning and unsupervised learning. When we're talking about uh, machine learning or AI, supervised learning means a supervisor can kind of go in and figure out where the problem occurred when the robot or the AI program didn't do what you wanted it to do. So here's yet another video. Hopefully this one will play. No? Okay. Okay. Here's a biped robot. We're going to talk about bipedal locomotion later in the course. Okay, but not great, right? Obviously, whatever this controller is for this robot, there's, there's room for improvement. It would be wonderful if we could go in and look at the brain of the robot and figure out exactly where things went wrong at which point in time. So in this cartoon <laughs> example here, the robot took a few steps and fell over. We go back and analyze the neural network or have a look at the controller and say, aha, it should have zigged at this point rather than, than zagged, it turns out that that is impossible to do. It's very difficult to isolate the problem. Again, it's hard to debug complex code. It's an order of magnitude more difficult to figure out where in the robot's brain things went, went wrong when it, when it failed. Okay, so if we can't do that, if we can't, if we can't do a detailed supervision, we can't isolate where the problem is, the nice thing about evolution is it doesn't really matter, right? If we take this robot and we create a randomly modified copy of it and it walks slightly further than its parent, then fine. We throw away the parent and keep the child. The child travels not quite as far as the parent. doesn't matter why the child failed. It just did. We throw it away. And if we iterate long enough, we can make improvements even if we don't know where the problems occurred in the ones that didn't survive. So we're going to treat our evolutionary algorithm as we go as a more or less unsupervised uh, machine learning problem. Okay, so there's four reasons why we might be using uh, evolutionary algorithms for robotics. And hopefully you'll see as we go along many more examples where an evolutionary algorithm gives us something of an advantage over other learning approaches. Okay. Any questions about course logistics motivation before we move on to lecture two? All good? Okay, so let's jump back to the schedule for a moment. And before we go to lecture two, um, I want to just sort of very quickly talk through the rest of the content in the course so you have a basic idea of, of where we're going. Obviously, in the first three lectures here, uh, we have a little bit of an introduction to the course. What we're going to do today is talk about a short history of AI so we can see in the broad landscape of AI and robotics where this small field of evolutionary robotics sits. We're going to spend some time in the world of psychology and philosophy talking about embodied cognition. We'll come back to that. In lectures four, five, and six, we're going to touch on the three main tools of the trade that you're going to need in the next couple weeks as you're working your way through the assignments. We already talked about these uh, last time. You're going to be using physical simulation for the task environment for your robot. We're going to be working with simulated robots in this class, not physical ones. So we'll talk about physical simulation a little bit. We'll talk about the brains of our robot, the robots, these artificial neural networks. And I'll give you a very crash course in evolutionary algorithms. 
There are courses here at UVM on artificial neural networks and evolutionary algorithms. So we're going to just treat these at a very surface level. And I'm going to give you just what you need to know to set up your evolutionary robotics experiment. OK. Then we'll switch into the history of the field itself. We'll look at some of the first experiments back in the early 90s with evolutionary robotics. Then we'll look at a collection of experiments collectively known as minimal cognition. How simple a robot can we create and evolve behaviors for it that someone who doesn't know anything about evolutionary algorithms or robots, if they saw that robot, they would point at that robot and say, that robot is doing something intelligent, or that robot is acting a little bit more intelligently than, than that one. What is the minimal set of behaviors a robot would have to have for someone to point at it and say, those machines at least seem on the road to becoming more, more intelligent? Okay. Then we'll spend some time talking about locomotion. So one of the major problems that robots have to uh, accomplish in order to be intelligent is to, is to move around uh, in their environment. There's an old sort of tongue-in-cheek question in biology, why don't plants have brains? Kind of set you up for the answer for this one. Why don't plants have brains? Or at least in a form that we're, we're not familiar with. Because they don't. They don't have to move, right? So there's a very fundamental relationship between movement and intelligence, and we'll explore it in lectures 11 and 12. I mentioned evolutionary robotics is a young field. There's a lot of open challenges in the field that no one has any good answer to. So in lectures 13 through 20, we'll talk about some of these challenges. Some of them have to do with the genotype to phenotype map. So we're, you're going to hear a number of biological terms in this course. Two of the ones you're going to hear most frequently are genotype and phenotype. Genotype is the data structure or whatever it is that contains the information for the phenotype, which is the body and the behavior of, in our case, the robot. How do you take a genotype or a DNA or a string of numbers and what is the translation process that turns that data structure into the brain of the robot and the body of the robot? And it turns out you can create different maps, different ways to translate genotype to phenotype, and some of them work better than others. Meaning if you don't get it right, it's very hard for evolution to evolve a robot for you. And if you do get that map right, it turns out it makes things much easier for evolution. Uh, when we say phenotype, do we mean both the actual physical robot, the prototype, and the virtual one, or just the physical? It depends. It, it's everything. It, it's the robot itself. So if we make a physical version of that robot, that still counts as the phenotype. Right. So in biology, phenotype is usually an umbrella term for everything about the organism. Right? It's physiology, uh, its nervous system, uh, its behavior, the whole thing. Right? It's a container, and we'll <coughs> use the term in the same way. Okay. Then we'll talk about one of the biggest problems in the field called crossing the reality gap. So if you do manage to evolve some interesting simulated robots uh, in this course, and you go downstairs at the end of the semester and 3D printed the robot, what is the chance that your physical robot would do in reality what your evolved simulated robot does in your physics engine? The answer is the chance is pretty much, probably is close to zero. It's very hard to take these evolved simulated robots and turn them into reality. We'll look at some approaches to try and deal with this. Very recently, people have addressed the scalability issue of evolutionary robotics. So in this course, by the end of this course, you'll probably have come up with a new fitness function and evolved uh, a new behavior for your robot, which is great. You can get your robot to do something. But we are all capable of doing depending on how you count, thousands or trillions of things, right? An intelligent organism or intelligent robot is not a specialist, not a thing that can do one thing well, but something that's gradually able to add more and more capability as you go. How could we scale up our evolutionary robotics experiments so that we have millions of people training millions of robots to do more and more things? And so we'll look at using uh, crowdsourcing as a way to try and scale up these experiments beyond one person setting up one evolutionary algorithm to evolve some robots to do one thing. Okay. And as I mentioned, 
One of the particular advantages of evolutionary algorithms is we can, we can broaden the reach of the evolutionary algorithm and place not just the brain of the robot under evolutionary control, but also the body. And we'll see some of those experiments. And again, why would you want to, to do that? You can, you can probably imagine that that's a much more complicated project that we're talking about. What is the advantage of allowing evolution to tinker with body and brain together? Okay, that's sort of a broad overview of where we're, where we're going. Uh, during the exam period, as I mentioned, there's no exam in this class. Uh, you will all be giving very brief pr oral presentations uh, on your final project. And we'll talk about that later. Any questions about the schedule? Okay, so on to lecture two. And uh, as you can imagine, in a historical lecture, we're going to do things in chronological order. So we're going to go a few centuries back to someone who said, cogito ergo sum. He actually said it in French, not Latin. Who was this? René Descartes. Descartes. OK. Why are we talking about Descartes in a robotics class? Seems like an odd mix. Uh, something you'll notice now in lectures two and subsequent lectures is from time to time you'll see empty red boxes on your slides. This is a prompt and a reminder to you to annotate your slides as we go. doesn't matter to me if you do it on paper or electronically, um, but definitely make sure to fill in these boxes uh, as we go. Okay, we're going to walk through, a, 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 uh, I apologize for this, a very surface treatment of Descartes' most famous argument which was written in which document? Where did I think therefore I am come from? Any ph philosophy students here? When are we talking about at least? Close, not quite the 1500s, but the 1600s. And this, was, this came from his Discourse on Method. So Kogito Hirosum, or I think therefore I am, asked pretty much the, the most fundamental question I guess you could ask, right? Do I exist? And that's where sort of the, the story starts in discourse on method with this, this question. How would you prove your own existence? Seems like kind of an odd thing to do, but the more you think about it, the more difficult it is to do. Descartes tried to tackle this by saying, well, what can I be sure of? What can I be sure exists? Well, there's this question, and if there's a question, something must have posed this question, and that thing is this thing, right? The I. Whatever that is, for, for Descartes, it was the soul, uh, if you like, the mind or the brain, but there is something that's asking the question. That thing, at least for Descartes, he was pretty sure existed. Again, you don't have to agree with him, but this is the flow of his, his argument. So the soul or the mind or the brain, take your pick, exists. It's something that's able to formulate this question. Now, everything else, not so sure about. Right? That's, this is not the stuff that's doing the question. There's something in here that is asking the question. That I can be sure of. Everything else, not so much. OK, so why does that matter for roboticists? The reason why is because the flow of this argument drives a wedge between the I, the thing that's asking the question, and everything else that may be a part of the I, but is definitely separate from the thing that's asking the question, which we would call the body. Right? So we're going to spend quite a bit of time, or we're going to, this is going to crop up from time to time in this class, this idea of Cartesian dualism, that there's this distinction <laughs> between mind and body, or brain and body, if you like. We can argue about where exactly that distinction occurs, but it definitely crops up, and it often crops up in ways that we don't anticipate, and it often causes problems for us. And as you'll see in the reading, and you'll see a bit today, it's been one of the things that's held up AI and robotics research for, for a long time. We've already seen dualism in robotics. I started by introducing you to evolutionary robotics and telling you how there's the robot and the artificial neural network or the brain or the thing that controls the robot. We're already making a distinction between these two things. It's very hard to get away from Cartesian dualism, at least in, in Western class. OK, so that's about as far back as we're going to go to start our story of AI and robotics. Let's start marching forward from them. So let's fast forward over three centuries to 1936. Alan Turing 
formulated the Turing machine, which at this time was just a thought experiment. There was no physical machine to go along with this. Here's a cartoon picture of the Turing machine. Anybody want to give us a two or three sentence summary of what a Turing machine is? What it does? Any takers? Yes? Um, machine that uh, basically represents um, everything that can be computed in the sense that computers like this do them. Um, and it has a set of has a set of rules it goes by and it could potentially run for infinity so you can't like actually truly implement one I guess unless you have infinite tape that, that's um, it infinite tape and infinite time yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's all I think. okay it's a good start so if you so we've got some internal rules. We have our little machine here. It has some rules. It has the tape. Tell me about the interaction between the machine and the tape. Yes? It can be able to move back and forth in the tape, and it can set each uh, cell, I guess, in the tape to either 1 or 0. Exactly. So the rules inside the Turing machine, uh, machine at each tick of the clock tell the machine what to do. Uh, it may read the symbol that's on the tape at the moment. You don't have to copy this verbatim, but you can write uh, the basics of a Turing machine down. It can either read the symbol that's at the current point on the tape. It can erase that symbol, replace that symbol with a new one, or it can move itself back and forth or move the tape back and forth. It doesn't really matter. And the machine has some internal state. Right? This is sort of the simplest machine that you can think of that is able to carry out these Turing complete problems, right? There's, there are relatively few problems that a Turing machine cannot solve. And all of the things that your computers do are, are things that can be solved by a Turing machine. So the Turing machine was, uh, at, in 1936, a thought experiment, which was then turned into physical machines during the war. Uh, there was the imitation movie, uh, imitation game movie last year, which tells the history of this, this part of computer science. So all of your laptops, all of your cell phones, the projector, everything that you see here that we would consider a computer is a physical instantiation of a Turing machine, which is great, which is fine. And we already see, again, Cartesian dualism here. We have the thing that's moving around, the machine itself, and it has its internal rules and its internal state. These are two very separate things. Right? Okay. It's a Turing machine. Let's move forward. We're not going to talk about the advent of computers themselves. Let's move forward now to the summer of 1956, which is sort of the official start of artificial intelligence. Uh, just down the road at Dartmouth College, there was a, a summer workshop that was held in 1956. Uh, a lot of uh, computer scientists, they weren't known as computer scientists yet, but they came together um, and they had this summer school. What I'm quoting here is the proposal that was submitted to the government to get a little bit of money to bring these people to Dartmouth for this summer school. Um, and they proposed to the government that they would hold a two-month, ten-man study. This is the 50s, so ten men, not ten people. Ten-man study of artificial intelligence be carried out. Uh, the study is to proceed on the basis of the conjecture that every aspect of learning or any other feature of intelligence can in principle be so precisely described that a machine can be made to simulate it. Okay. Or reproduce it. And again, we'll come back to that. Can a machine simulate intelligence or could a machine actually be intelligent? We'll talk about that in a moment. An attempt will be made to find out how to make machines do all these different building blocks of intelligence, including language, form abstraction, and concepts, and solve kinds of problems that are now resolved, uh, reserved for humans. And by the way, they'll also improve themselves. Uh, and we think that a significant advance can be made in one or most of these problems if we have a carefully selected group of very smart people to come together and work on it for a summer. We'll work out most of AI uh, over the summer of 1956. How did they do? 
What's that? Not well. Not so well. Not yet, right? So what is 2016? So we're 60 years on, right? And we've barely scratched the surface of these things, right? Last few years, we made a little bit more progress, but still just kind of scratching the surface. Why? Why this amazing optimism and this fantastic failure or lack of progress for 60 years? Um, well, I can't really know what they were saying back then, but like, we tend to kind of assume that the things we're really good at are easy uh, when they're monstrously difficult. Okay. You know, like image recognition or voice recognition or anything. Voice recognition or image recognition turned out, in retrospect, to be pretty hard. Yeah. What turned out that we thought was going to be hard was actually easy. Chess. Yes, I heard someone meant talking about chess just before class started, right? Hard for us, not so hard for computers. So part of the problem was the things that we thought were hard are easy, and the things that we thought were easy were hard. What were some of the other obstacles? What are things that have held up research for 60 years? Processing power. Processing power, right? You'll always hear this at AI conferences or if an AI researcher is reported in, a, in an article, don't worry, in five years when we have more computing power, now we're going to have intelligent machines. They've been saying that since 1956. And yes, again, it's, part, it's been part of the problem, but it's not clear <coughs> that it's the whole problem. So what else? Hard problems are easy. Easy problems are hard. They didn't have much computing power back in 1956. There's a third problem here that's more subtle, which I would argue is the one that's really held up all the progress. You can actually see it in the proposal here. Any other feature of intelligence can, in principle, be pre so precisely described. That's the problem. It turns out it's incredibly difficult to describe precisely what we mean or what we do when we form abstractions, when we recognize a familiar face in a fraction of a second. When you daydream, when you come up with a new solution to a problem, when you think outside the box. We can talk about all these things in everyday language, but if you try and reduce thinking outside the box down to a mathematical description, if you try and precisely describe it, maybe it's possible, but no one's been able to do it yet. Right? All of these concepts, all of the things that have to do with intelligence, cognition, forming abstraction, abstractly thinking outside the box, brainstorming, all these kinds of things, intuitively we know what they mean because we can do them. But to actually sit down and try and describe them precisely so that you could then code it up in a machine, very, very difficult to do. That is the main roadblock to AI. We just talked about the Turing machine that started in the 1930s. Computers started in the 1940s. The first robot was built in the early 1950s. We'll see that robot in a little bit. So computers and robots both started at the same time. We've got plenty of computers in this room. We don't have a single autonomous or adaptive robot in this room. Right? Two technologies that started at the same time. There was optimism about both of them. One of them took off beyond anyone's wildest imaginations. The other one turns out to be exceedingly difficult. OK. OK, here's a list of the uh, attendees, just for fun. Does anybody recognize any of these names? Yes? Uh, McCarthy, he was at MIT and invented LISP. That's true. He's the inventor of LISP and also the coiner of the term artificial intelligence. LISP, the, the LISP programming language was used for a lot of early AI research. Other familiar names here? Uh, Shannon. Yes. Um, Entropy. Entropy and a mathematical description of information, right? We live in the information age. What do we mean by information? Shannon was the one who actually defined what that, that means. Other familiar names here? OK. Uh, Marvin Minsky was the co-founder of the MIT AI Lab. This is Mecca for all things AI and robotics. We're going to see um, we're going we're gonna to see a lot of work that came out of the MIT AI lab as we, as we go along. Shannon, the father of information theory, uh, for the mathematicians among you, a very important person to know. Uh, Herbert Simon wrote a lot of uh, really interesting uh, books about uh, AI 
and rationality in general. So for Simon, one of the important building blocks of intelligence is rationality, how rational are humans. Turns out we're not as rational as we like to think we are. Uh, and he won a Nobel Prize for that back in the late, the late 70s. For those of you that are interested in the history of AI and robotics, go Google these names, and there's a lot of interesting characters in this story that unfortunately we're not going to have time to talk about in this, in this course. Okay, so um, coming back to, the, uh, to 1956, this idea of trying to precisely describe the building blocks of cognition. In general, this is what we're trying to do in robotics, right? Is to try and understand biological systems. We might observe humans, we might observe animals, and try and understand, <coughs> or try and more precisely under, understand and describe what it is that they do. <coughs> Maybe we want to start at something a little bit more humble. Let's, let's set aside thinking outside the box or brainstorming for a moment and think about something very, very simple like phototaxis. Phototaxis is a very simple behavior that you see in the simplest uh, organisms move towards light or for some organisms move away from light. Photophobia. Doesn't really matter. Okay. How do animals actually go about doing that? It turns out that this exceedingly simple behavior, there was a lot of argument in the 70s and 80s about how animals actually did that. We'll come back to that in a few slides. Once we get a handle on how animals do it, now we want to try and abstract things away. So the way that Mother Nature figured out how to get animals to do phototaxis, there might be a lot of those biological details that are not, known, not so necessary for us, so we want to sort of throw those away and keep just the essence of the behavior so that we can then build it into, uh, we can build it into a robot. Okay, I think in the interest of time, I won't play this video, but there's a little Lego robot here, and if you watch, it will turn towards the light and then smash into it. We can get a Lego robot to do phototaxis. Not, uh, not that difficult. Okay, the abstraction part is really diff difficult to do. It's easy in retrospect to realize what should have been thrown away, but before the ha beforehand, not, not so easy. Can you think of any examples from the history uh, of technology in general? where this was a problem? Particular technology that people couldn't seem to get off the ground until they abstracted away certain details? There's a pun hidden in that sentence to give you a... I was going to say plane. Planes, right? Plane. So, lots of animals out there that are heavier than air that manage to fly around just fine, right? Millions of examples for us that it's possible. It took humans quite a while to figure out how that how that works. Well, clearly flying had something to do with flapping, right? If you go back and watch all those very old videos pre uh, Wright Brothers, you see all these crazy flapping contraptions, right? The key was to realize that there are certain aspects of aerodynamics that we can throw away. We can throw away the flapping, especially when we're trying to build something that is much larger than the average bird. Easy to kind of see in retrospect if you know something about aerodynamics. We face the same problem in robotics, right? There's a whole bunch of adaptive and autonomous machines in this room, but if we wanted to build uh, robotic versions of humans, do we need to copy every single biological detail that allows us to abstract, think outside the box, brainstorm, and so on? So one of the big challenges in AI is precise description, and the other one is abstraction, right? What do we throw away and what do we keep and build into our, our robots? Okay, keep, again, keep that in mind as we, as we go. Okay, let's move forward a little bit in time to the uh, 1960s. This was a very famous AI project at that time known as ELISA, the robot uh, psychotherapist. Uh, so you'd open up a terminal, and Eliza would uh, ask you a question, and you might respond by saying, I am really angry uh, with my friend Jane. And Eliza would turn around and say, why are you, or do you, why are you so angry with your friend Jane? Amazing, right? This feeling, understanding, listening machine. Um, and at the time, uh, people were brought into the lab who didn't know that this was a computer or a person on the other side, and they would have very, very long conversations and pour their hearts out to, to Eliza. 
even after they were told that this was a computer, they would continue to engage with this, this program. Why? It felt human somehow, right? Surprisingly, again, there were some pretty simple if-then-else clauses in there. So the ELISA program is nothing more than a very greatly indented if-then-else switch case statements that would look for particular sentence constructions and invert them in particular prescribed ways. And most of the time, it made ELISA seem more or less human-like. But of course, ELISA would make mistakes that would very quickly give her away as a computer program. Eliza has morphed over the decades into the, the chatbots that we have today, right? There's contests out there to try and create the most human-like chatbot that you can. That, that you can. So in the 60s, the idea for AI said, well, wait a second, we can hold long, involved conversations. Maybe what we're doing is nothing more than a whole bunch of if-then-else if, statements. So if we put enough of them in there, if we indent our if-then-else statement far enough, we'll finally get a computer program that can hold an intelligent conversation on arbitrary topics for arbitrary lengths of time. That may be true. No one's been able to do it yet. Okay. So rule-based AI held for most of the 60s and 70s and 80s. Eliza was uh, tested to see whether Eliza could pass the Turing test. So we talked about the Turing machine, very different from the Turing test. So Alan Turing said, well, if we can't precisely describe what intelligence is, we can at least recognize it when we see it. Okay. How many of you have seen Blade Runner? Required watching for this course if you haven't seen it yet. Care if I talk? I'm kind of nervous when I take tests. Oh, just please don't move. Oh, sorry. I already had an IQ test this year. I don't think I've ever had an Action time is a factor in this, so please pay attention. I answer as quickly as you can. Sure. 1187 Winter That's the hotel. What? Where I live. Nice place? Yeah, sure, I guess. Is that part of the test? No. Just warming up, that's all. Huh. It's not fancy or anything. You're in a desert, walking along in the sand, and all of a sudden. Is this the test now? Yes. You're in a desert, walking along. Okay, I won't play the whole video, but you can probably imagine things don't end well for one of the two interlocutors here, the Turing test. Okay, so uh, the Turing test is one proposal for how we would actually go about measuring the intelligence of a robot or a machine. Maybe we're done. Is this the only measure we need? Is everyone comfortable with the Turing test as a way to measure intelligence in machines? Anybody have a problem with the Turing test? Mm -hmm. I guess computers have been able to fake their way through the Turing test. We've already had a few that passed, so we don't really have, I guess, what we think of as an actual AI built yet. Could be, right? So there's been, there's been reports that there have been chatbots that have passed the Turing test. What do we, you know, what actual metrics are we going to use to decide whether a chatbot has passed the test or not? How long do you have to keep talking in order to pass it? What questions should you be asked? Um, so it's very limited, like learning, uh, new behaviors, like a lot of what we consider to be, you know, human intelligence is developed over time. And it's unclear whether a program that just like can talk um, is intelligent. Yeah. Okay, exactly. So let's say 10 years from now there's a chatbot and you hold a two hour conversation with this chatbot and it's the most intellectually stimulating, emotionally fulfilling conversation you've ever had. Are you happy to say this, this chatbot is intelligent? No different from human intelligence. We should ask the chatbot, honestly. <laughs> like that point. There's, there's a good homework assignment. Find a chatbot that's out there and ask it that exact question. <laughs> 
There's something for most people about the Turing test that's somehow unsatisfying, right? And again, it has to do with us not being able to precisely describe what we mean by intelligence. One of the biggest uh, criticisms against the Turing test came from John Searle. I apologize if you can't read the text here, but you can read it on the slide. Uh, John Searle came up with a thought experiment called the Chinese Room Argument as a way to try and demolish the Turing test, to try and prove why the Turing test does not capture the essence of intelligence. Okay, here's how the thought experiment goes. Imagine we put someone in a room, and this person has no communication with the outside world. Assume that this person cannot speak Mandarin. Let's assume it's an English speaker. We have a couple of people outside the room who do speak Mandarin. They write a question in Mandarin, and they pass it through the slot in the door to the person inside. The person sees nothing more than a whole bunch of squigg squiggles. However, this person has a huge rule book sitting in front of them. And they go through this rule book and they look up this squiggle and it says if you see this squiggle, uh, write this squiggle underneath it, then, do th then write this squiggle, then this squiggle. A huge, very complex rule book. And this rule book can be as big as you want, doesn't really matter. A whole bunch of arbitrarily complex rules complex enough so that this person writes these squiggles on a piece of paper, passes the piece of paper back through the slot in the door, and the Mandarin speaker receives it and reads that this is a perfectly reasonable response to their question. Now, if this person is going to try and engage in a natural language conversation with this person, you're going to have to have a pretty big rule book but presumably there is a finite rule book out there that you could make that there would be a good enough set of if-then-else statements, if you like, Eliza style, that would give cogent responses to this question. This person, or this combination of person and rule book, would pass the Turing test in this thought experiment. So this thing is intelligent. This thing understands Chinese, understands Mandarin. Are you okay with that definition? Where's the intelligence here? What's that? Is it in the rule book? But the rule book is not sentient. It's just a bunch of pieces of paper or millions of lines of code. So is the intelligence in the rule book? Whoever created the rule book, maybe, right? So maybe we have to go back to a person which would then mean that any AI program that convinces others that it's intelligent, it's not the program that's intelligent, it's the person that wrote the program. Okay, maybe, right? For some people, that's, that's, a, that's an answer to the Chinese room problem. For other people, the person who is taking the squiggles and consulting the rule book and figuring out how to respond, this whole process, this combination of person and rule book and closed off room, that thing as a whole is the thing that is thinking. Inside your Chinese room, inside your skull, there is something that is looking up things in response to stuff that's coming in from the outside. You are transcribing what's coming in from the outside into, in your case, actions. And Outside observers who observe you perceiving your environment and responding, hopefully, appropriately to the stimulus, that person is acting rationally or intelligently, or that person just thought outside the box, and so on. So for some people, what we mean by thinking is that process as a whole. Right? The moment you start pointing fingers and saying the intelligence is there, we've got a problem. So if we say the intelligence is in the person that wrote the rule book, okay, so now the finger's pointing back at us. We're intelligent. Where is the intelligence in here? There's almost like an infinite regression of Chinese rooms. Where in here is the intelligence going on? Okay. Again, we've, we've diverged into philosophy here. There is no hard and fast answer, just different approaches to this very hard to nail down issue of what exactly do we mean by intelligence. Okay, let's move forward to the 1980s now. 
Um, this is a book, Vehicles. We're going to see a number of uh, robots or vehicles from this book as we go. Has anyone come across Breitenberg's Vehicles book before? A couple people. Okay. Valentino Breitenberg was a neural physiologist. He studied uh, fruit flies back in the 1970s, and he worked on this pr a problem that I mentioned before of taxis behavior. So not phototaxis in this case, but chemotaxis. So if there, if there was a piece of rotting fruit in the back corner and we unleashed a vial of fruit flies, they would very quickly find the fruit. Back in the 1970s, there were theories floating around saying uh, that fruit flies were performing differential calculus, were computing gradients uh, in 3D space, orienting towards the gradient of the odor that they could smell, triangulate on the odor, and reach the fruit. During that time, as a younger man, Breitenberg was dissecting the brains of these fruit flies. You know how small fruit flies are. You can probably imagine how small the brain of a fruit fly was. Breitenberg said, hold on a second. I don't think there's any calculus going on inside this. So is there a simpler explanation for how a fruit fly will unerringly find the fruit, and it turns out that there are some exceedingly simple answers that were missed by neurophysiologists and neuroscientists at the time. They hugely overshot the goal. Okay, and we'll see some of those in a moment, but what Brainberg did was to turn around and say, look, it, let's write a book called Vehicles, and he purposely chose the term vehicle so that it wasn't an organism, it didn't have the connotations of a robot. It was meant to be kind of an ambiguous term. So we can think of vehicles as organisms or robots, doesn't, doesn't really matter for our purposes. Okay, uh, the book starts with vehicle one. It works its way up through increasingly sophisticated vehicles. Vehicle one is the simplest robot you're ever going to see in this class. We have the body of the robot. We have a single sensor here, which is a temperature sensor, and this temperature sensor is connected by a single wire, which we'll henceforth refer to as a synapse, something that connects a sensor neuron to a motor neuron. A wire or synapse that attaches to a wheel, and you can imagine now with this single sensor attached by a wire to a single wheel, uh, that this vehicle will always move in a straight line, slow down in the cold and speed up in the warm. Why slow down in the cold and speed up in the warm? Let's talk about the actual sensor motor mechanics of this robot. Why does it slow down when things get cold? The speed of the motor is determined by the temperature it's reading. Exactly, right? So this is the simplest neural network you'll see, right? The colder it is, the lower the reading at the temperature sensor, the lower the reading the slower the wheel turns, the higher the reading of the temperature, the faster the wheel turns. It's not rocket science, right? This one's pretty, pretty straightforward. Okay, so now Bradenberg takes a step back from this robot and describes it. Imagine now what you would think if you saw such a vehicle swimming around in a pond. It's restless, you would say, it does not like warm water. But it's quite stupid since it's not able to turn back to the nice cold spot uh, it overshot in its restlessness. Anyways, you'd say it seems like it's, it's alive. It's doing what living things seem to do, since you've never seen a particle of dead matter move around quite like that. Do you all agree with this description? Is this robot restless? Is it stupid? What, uh, what else does he use here? Is it alive? This is clearly inflammatory language, right? Why would a very serious and world-renowned <coughs> neurophysiologist use this kind of language describing this kind of vehicle? Why do that? Okay, I'll leave that question for a moment. I'll come back to it. Let's look at vehicle series two. So slightly more difficult, slightly more complex here. Now we've got a robot with two wheels, two sensors on the front. Now they're no longer temperature sensors, but light sensors. So the more light that falls on the sensor, the more strongly it fires. And these sensors are attached to these motors contralaterally, meaning across the line. So that now the stronger the left sensor fires, the faster the right wheel turns, and vice versa. 
Brainberg called this particular robot the aggressor. Why? What is the robot? Well, you can kind of see here, right? What it does when there's a light to the front, the front left. When there's a light to the front left of the robot, there's more light falling on the left sensor compared to the right sensor, which means the right wheel turns faster than the left wheel. So this robot turns a little bit towards the light. What happens at the next time step? So at this point in time, the robot now turns a little bit towards the light. What happens next, given this neural network and this robot? It'll keep turning faster. It'll keep turning until it's facing it, and it'll turn faster because as it's turning, it's getting closer to the light in general. More stimulation on the wheels, uh, more stimulation on the sensors, faster the wheels turn. What happens once it starts to face the light directly? Right? It'll accelerate, and if it's a naked light bulb, it'll, cr it'll crush it. Okay, so if you read the book, uh, Greenberg <laughs> describes the aggressor as something that hates lights with a passion and will destroy them if it can. Does the aggressor hate? Where's the, where's the hate circuit in here? I don't know. Let's look at vehicle, I think this is 2B. Same thing as before, two light sensors, two wheels, but now we have an ipsilateral set of connections meeting on the same side, left sensor attached to left wheel, and same for the right. What happens now if we come at this robot with a flashlight from the front right? It'll turn away from it, It'll turn away from it right? So more light is falling on the right, which means the right wheel turns faster and it'll turn away from the light. What happens when it's now facing a little bit away from the light? What happens at the next time instant? It slows down, right? Because the the light because the light sensors have moved a little bit away. Let's imagine that they're omnidirectional sensors, so it can sort of see the light that's now behind it, but the light is further away, so the robot has slowed down. What happens if I start chasing it with a flashlight now? What's it going to do? It'll keep running away, right? So we had the aggressor. This is the any guesses? The coward, right? This is the coward. It's afraid of lights. Does this robot fear? Does the aggressor hate? Is vehicle one restless? Does everyone here agree that none of these things actually have these states? Okay. But you all, from time to time, hate, fear, become restless become curious, become bored, right? We're not, we're not Valentino Bradenburg vehicles, right? We're something different. You okay with that definition? Why? You've got more wires. You have 10 to the, what is it, 10 to the 12 wires. Many more wires than Bradenburg vehicles, many more sensors, very more uh, motors. Is it a matter of quantity? What if we did build a Breitenberg vehicle with as many sensors and motors as we have and as many synapses and neurons as we have? Now can the vehicle hate, be curious, and so on? Is it just a matter of amount? Because it's only specialized circuitry that makes it feel like whatever feeling really is. Okay, maybe if we could again precisely describe what that what that is, right? Um, being able to change from state to state. Okay, so if you keep, if you go and read the uh, vehicles book, and it's pretty short, and it's as you can imagine, kind of a fun read. There are vehicles later in the series that learn that have internal state and so on. You can probably guess now that Greenberg kind of had two goals here. The first one, the surface one, was to say, look it, don't overthink things. Often when we look at organisms from a distance, we attribute more complexity to them than is actually there. It turns out that, at least for fruit flies, there are much simpler circuits we can imagine that produces the behavior that you're interested in. The underneath 
goal of this book, right, is to kind of ch challenge our assumptions of our own identity, right? He wrote this book in a way that you should be repulsed by the vehicle. Say, wait a second, they don't have any of these emotional states, but we do. And you better figure out by the time you get to the end of the book what you think that, that difference is. Right? And Bradenburg doesn't make it easy for you. Okay, again, a little bit of philosophy for you, but, but there you go. Okay, and an introduction to the building blocks of, of robotics. Okay, so let's stay in the 1980s for a moment. Up until this point, most AI programs had been these very complex nested if-then-else loops. But obviously, neural scientists were learning more about the brain at this time and realizing that the brain is a massively parallel machine. Now, maybe that massively parallel machine is actually instantiating a bunch, a bunch of if-then-else statements, but maybe not. So around this time, uh, AI researchers came up with this idea of artificial neural networks, which we're going to spend a fair bit of time talking about in this course, which are simplified models of biological neural networks. So in the same way when we talked about evolutionary algorithms, evolutionary algorithms are like evolution, but they're not biological evolution. They abstract away a lot of the details. They're a simplified version of it. Same thing with artificial neural networks. Now it turns out that the human brain is the most complex artifact we know of in the universe, so it's pretty difficult to, to abstract down the details, and we don't really even understand how this thing works, but we can try. One of the basic things you see in the brain is a whole bunch of neurons that are connected by synapses to other neurons. You can take an artificial neural network then, and as we just saw in the Bradenburg vehicles, we could drop it into a robot so that the input, send, uh, the input neurons collect uh, in, uh, measurements from the outside world, those measurements then flow along these synapses and are transformed into new signals, which then arrive at the motor neurons. And the signals that arrive at the motor neurons either tell our muscles how to contract, or in the case of the robot, tell a motor how to, how to turn. It's basically uh, the, the essence of an artificial neural network. Now again, in artificial neural networks, what do you add in and what do you take out? Okay, artificial neural networks uh, has had an interesting history. So it started out to be, in the 1980s, it was he hailed as the answer to AI. All right, we've been stuck since 1956. It's now the 1980s. We've got these things called artificial neural networks that do some pretty interesting things. This is it. We're, it's the beginning of the end. We're about to solve uh, all the problems in AI. Turns out that ANNs did not realize their promise in the 1980s. AI entered one of the first AI winters. Um, so basically, everyone lost hope and, and trust in AI researchers and what they were doing. Artificial neural networks went out of fashion for 30 years until about three or four years ago, or last year, depending on how you count. And they've come back into fashion with a vengeance. Who's heard of deep learning. Some people, but not everybody. Okay, so uh, most of what's going on in your phone here that's adaptive is probably being run by one of these things. Autonomous cars that are being developed right now are being run with these things. Uh, you take a picture with your phone, face recognition, it's being done by one of these things. So it's an interesting idea that this particular technology of artificial neural networks has existed since the 1980s, but no one could really get them to work well for 30 years. And now with the advent of big data, so having enough data to train these artificial neural networks, and some other mathematical innovations, which we're not going to go into in this class, now they seem to be working well. I'm going to, again, now give a very surface description of how deep networks work. Uh, Professor Snap is teaching a course this semester, Neural Computation, and if you're interested in deep networks, that's the place to learn more about them. Here's our input layer here, and maybe we don't have an output layer here, but we can consider this the output layer for a moment. Let's imagine that we want our deep belief network, or our, our deep network, to recognize faces in an image. So imagine this is not a line, but a grid of points, and every point here gets the grayscale value of a single pixel in an image. So we basically present an image, 
uh, to the input side of the deep belief network, and those values start to propagate up through these levels. And at the end, we look at some of these to see whether they light up, for example, when there's a face there, and to check that this neuron does not light up when there's not a face there. So we're going we're to tweak all of these connections so that there are neurons in the upper layers here that only turn on when there's a face in the image, or they only turn on when there's a car in the image, or a cat, or what have you. Right? Doesn't, doesn't matter. Turns out that you can now do that. It takes a little bit of doing, but you can do it as long as you have millions uh, of images. Once you train your artificial neural network to do this, you can do some interesting things with it or observe some interesting things about it. One of the first things you can observe is neurons that are close to the input layer tend to light up for local, uh, local features. So this particular neuron here in this cartoon may only light up when there is a diagonal line in this particular part of the image. So it's looking for a very low level feature at a particular local place in the image. This one might light up when there's a straight line in the lower left of the image. So these ones are learning low level features and the higher up you go, you get neurons that are more and more selective. So they'll only turn on when there's a face or a cat or what have you. One of the innovations for deep belief networks was, again, an observation from nature. It turns out that the set of connections that go from your retina all the way through your visual cortex tend to have the same kind of pattern. Neurons that are close to your retina tend to light up, so to speak, when they recognize a local low-level feature. And there are neurons further back in your visual cortex, so further from your retina, that only light up when you see your friend or your cat or what have you. They become more and more selective. So there's a lot of biological realism here. One of the other cool things you can do with a deep belief network is you can clamp a neuron. So let's say that we clamp this neuron to be on. So we're stimulating this neuron for faces. And these connections are actually bi-directional. So information can flow up and they can flow down. So if you take a trained deep belief network, you turn this network on and you force this neuron to stay on, information will flow along these lines and it will also flow back down to the input layer. And again, as I mentioned, the neurons that are at the very input layer represent grayscale images. So if you clamp that neuron and then look at, at the grayscale values output by these neurons, you get something like this. So you can get the neural network to tell you what it's thinking about. If you clamp this neuron and then look to see what arrives here, you get something that most of us would recognize as a cat. There's a whole subculture now around uh, deep belief networks called deep dreaming. I'll just show you a few of these, these images. They're fun to look at. OK, so here, here are some deep dreaming images. So what they do in this case is to clamp things at both ends. So they will present a particular image at the input layer and clamp the neuron at a higher layer and allow stuff that flows down to modify the input layer given the original initial image. OK can probably tell what the initial image was here, right? But it's clearly not the original photograph. How has the photograph been changed? A little hard to see maybe in this case. How about this one here? <laughs> they presented an image of a dog. What kind of neuron do you think they clamped in the upper reaches of this deep belief network? A, a dog, right? Dog dogs. It's a dog made of dogs, right? <laughs> so you're you're forcing the deep belief network to dream. You're 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 asking it to pr project back an image at the input layer of whatever you expect when this neuron is high, and use it to modify what I actually presented at the input, which was a an image of a dog, right? So it's a dog made up of dogs, 
If you go through Google Images here for deep dreaming, see if you can figure out what the original image is and make a guess for what neuron was clamped at an upper level of the, the neural network. Okay, good fun. Okay, so uh, I mentioned AI winters, and I just wanted to, to take a moment to talk a little bit about this. Robotics and AI in 60 years has never been as popular as it is right now. And obviously everybody is wondering whether this AI high summer will continue. Who knows? We'll, we'll see. Um, the history of AI is interesting. You can go and read more about it, the wiki, uh, wiki page for AI winters. There have been two major winters so far. I, I told you about the second winter already that occurred in the late 80s, the early 1990s, when the original promise of artificial neurons, uh, artificial neural networks didn't hold up. There was another winter in the 1970s. Does anybody remember uh, fifth, fifth, fifth wave computing, fifth generation computing? Has anybody heard of expert systems? Few people, but not many. These were the things that were going to solve AI back in the 1970s. Artificial neural networks in their 80s form was going to solve AI in the 80s. Now in the 10s, we have deep belief networks. And if you go and read about deep belief networks, there's a lot of people out there claiming that this thing is going to solve all our problems in AI. Who knows? Who knows? We'll see. We'll see. This is a quote from Hans Moravec, who was a researcher at the MIT uh, AI lab back in the 60s and 70s. This is a quote from something he said that was quoted in a, a history AI book. He was talking at this point about researchers overstating their claims about their AI program. So many researchers uh, in the 1970s were caught up in a web of increasing exaggeration. They were making promises to DARPA, which is the research wing of the military. They made promises that were too optimistic. Uh, what they delivered clearly stopped considerably short of what they had promised. But they felt that they couldn't promise less in the next proposal or they wouldn't get money, right? So they, had, they were stuck in this feedback loop where they had to keep promising more and more uh, that would be coming from their AI projects. A lot of AI and robotics researchers are now caught up in this feedback loop again. So we'll see what happens in the, in the years to come. Okay. So it's an interesting time to be working in AI and, and robotics. Okay, uh, obviously this is sort of a very, very shallow treatment of the history of AI and robotics. I tried to put together this slide to situate some of the things that we just talked about. We spent a fair bit of time talking about artificial intelligence. Machine learning kind of spun off from that where machine learning said, we're gonna just focus on one problem in AI, which is recognizing patterns in large amounts of data. Very important, Re uh, data mining related to that. Evolutionary computation we've already talked about. Connectionism is anything that's made up of a massive number of things that are connected to get together in a distributed manner. Usually that's artificial neural networks, which draws on neural science and computational neuroscience. That's one side of things. On the other side of things, we have robotics. Obviously in this course, we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about evolutionary robotics. We're going to spend a little bit of time looking at some evolutionary robotics approaches to swarm robotics, getting multiple robots to do things together. Developmental robotics is looking at development in the sense of how an infant grows into an adult. So looking at lifetime change and trying to create robots that start out as babies and learn about their environment as their bodies and brains become more sophisticated over their lifetime. Biorobotics is a subfield in robotics where you take a particular organism or a human and try and build a robotic analog of just that organism. So biorobotics tends to focus on the products of evolution. Take this animal and build it in robot form. Evolutionary robotics focuses on the process of evolution. We're not trying to copy any particular animal. We're trying to copy the process that gave rise to all animals. We already talked about industrial robotics. So I'll finish today just by dividing all of these fields into two. All of these approaches are non-embodied. So everything on this side, these are AI programs that don't have a body, right? Back to Cartesian dualism. They're brains, if you like, 
or thinking things that have no body. We're going to spend next time talking about embodied cognition. So in robotics, in all its branches, there's the idea that if we want to create something that's smart, it has to have a body to push against the world and observe how the world pushes back. Okay, I think we'll finish with that today. You have a quiz due at midnight tonight, and your first assignment is due at midnight on Monday. We'll talk about assignment two Tuesday morning. Thanks very much.